The Lakers, they are the favorites to win the NBA championship because they're the best team that's ever existed in sports. And you should pick all of their players in the first round of fantasy drafts. And Michael Bolton agrees. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here. And it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy, your daily NBA fantasy podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I hope you liked my audition for ESPN after they let go of Zach Lowe. I think there's a position available for me in contributing to the dumbest basketball conversation ever, which will only amplify losing one of the best people at talking about basketball. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com, and you can find me on Twitter, as always, at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. You can start the season with a big return. Place your first $5 bet on FanDuel, and you get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Thank you also. For making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day, we are free and we are available on all platforms. So double bang and leave your comments down below and carry the hell on. I am here to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers, ESPN's favorite topic as, again, the absolute insanity of what... uh, Yes, maybe they were paying Zach Lowe a lot of money. He deserved it. He was awesome. But the fact that they lean into the absolute dumbest coverage of all time and will continue to do it and... That's you know, that's partly their fault. It is also partly they are just responding to the market and they know, well, this is what people watch, isn't it? And I, I cannot, for any reason at all, think why people would want to watch the garbage that gets churned out with fake debates and focusing on three teams, but it's what happens. So I, I sort of, from that perspective, I, I do understand it. And I wish that, that people were more supportive of better conversations, more more interesting, funny, in-depth conversations versus who wins the next title, Lakers or Yankees? What about the Cowboys? Are they there? But they understand that what brings in money and what brings in eyes, and that that's an unfortunate reality. So there is a blame there, and you could easily say, well, the reason that people look to that sort of content is because that's what ESPN puts out. If ESPN decided not to put that sort of... This is, I didn't mean to soliloquize here... If ESPN stops putting out that debate content and catering to the lowest um, level of fan and you know, three main markets and that's it, somebody else would just do it and somebody else would cover those things and the people who consume that content would just go to that source and ESPN running as a business would lose those people. So there is an understanding there and it's, I, I don't know the solution. I try to put out stuff that is hopefully entertaining and informative and in-depth and not biased towards markets, teams, whatever, and try to do that on a broad range. But but I do get the the mass market implications. You know, I, I could sit here and do clickbait, trash comments, headlines, articles that we all know are false. But I don't. But I get it. To a degree. It's still stupid that Zach Lowe is gone. But anyway, we'll see. I'm sure he'll pop up somewhere really, really soon. And I, uh, I hope, I hope we, I hope we see that really soon. And where he goes and the content that he puts out is awesome because he, he's really well. No one has said a bad word about Zach Lowe. I don't think anyone that consumes his content or, or works in the media. And I've only had, I think, one interaction with him. Maybe brief, thirty seconds, a minute, not much. But really kind guy, really nice. You know, and the stories you hear from others of the help that he's given them has been fantastic. Anyway, locked on fantasy basketball bowl. Sending out more emails, the um, Roto League, the uh, draft positions and draft times in our set, so you would have an email about that. Still waiting on a couple of people to sign up, so check your email inbox to see whether you've got a replacement invite. The Red Division or the Red League, the Blue League, are all set and paid up. The Brown League has got about three left, but you've also got your um, draft order and positions set, so check that. And then we're waiting on the Points League ones because still got a few in the yellow and the black and the white to accept the white. Still, uh, the points league interest this season has been way lower. So if you are looking for a points league, if you're locked on fantasy basketball, there are plenty of spots available. 
And then the final pink, purple, orange head-to-head leagues. Still got to go through. I think there's about 20 or so people in each of those that hasn't paid and need to get those numbers up as well. So check out your invitations. You know what Lockdown Fantasy Basketball Bowl is by now. And if you don't, check the links below for rules and check the links below for the application form to get your details in so I know what league you want in. And we still have the opportunity to expand stuff if the once we get it all sorted and we see where we're at, we can do more. We're talking Lakers. We're talking about the fantasy season for this squad, which is a team that thankfully from a analysis perspective, it hasn't really changed at all from where they were last season because they didn't do anything in free agency. Their big free agent move was signing Christian Coloco to a two-way contract. Let's look at the projected starting five on this squad. I don't think there's going to be another way they go here. D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, LeBron James, Rui Hachimura, and Anthony Davis. The debate will be around Rui. I do not believe that Rui Hachimura is a starting quality player, and I think a team that is starting Rui is not a serious championship contender or a serious high-end playoff guy. I, I, You know my thoughts on Rui. If you're new to the show, it's that he is bad. And they could put other guys in there. Jared Vanderbilt is an option to start in that spot. Absolute left field opportunity. Is it Max Christie that starts? We'll see. JJ Redick, we don't know what JJ Redick's going to do because we didn't have any sort of indication whatsoever of what he's like as a coach. What is he going to value? How's he going to run a rotation? How tight's it going to be? How's he going to stagger? What's his pace like? We don't know any of these answers. So at the moment, I'm putting Hachimura there, but it could be Vanderbilt. It could be Christie. I, I highly, highly doubt it. someone like Dalton Connect, but I'll throw the name out there because someone will mention it. But that's how I think they're going to line up. I think that's the starting group for your your or my, or not mine, absolutely not mine, Los Angeles Lakers. So you will be, I think you'll be surprised to know that when we talk about undervalued players on the Lakers, there's nobody. I, I don't look at this Lakers team and their current ADPs and ranks and go, oh yeah, the, yeah, the people are definitely not thinking about this guy. You could make an argument you could make an argument that LeBron in certain situations is somewhat undervalued. But the risk of LeBron is he is 40 years old. So while where he is ranked and his ADPs for categories and points is almost assuredly higher than what he'll actually finish or higher, lower. You know, like Let's say he might be the 12th best player and he's ranked 22nd. That's how I see that working. But at 40 years of age, you have to understand that there is healing risks from injury, there's injury risk happening. There is, at this point, I'm just going to say that LeBron is never declining enough to matter. It's just, uh, what I've been saying for six years, he's just never, he's declined for sure, but it doesn't decline enough to matter. It's more about injuries and recovery at that age as to, as to where, where he is. And he was remarkably healthy last season after they started the season telling us that he was going to play 30 minutes a night that lasted one game. He has had an extra off-season workload playing in the Olympics, obviously. So we'll see what that does for him in terms of how they manage him throughout the season. But, I don't see anyone as being an undervalued player on this Lakers squad. On the flip side, is there anyone that is overvalued? Well, yeah, but not like, not massively. Usually you would come into a situation where we're talking Lakers, hearkening back to the discussion at the start about mass market bias and big teams and all that sort of stuff where Lakers guys get consistently overrated. There are two guys, and this this is interesting because they're two guys that I really like. You'll be shocked to know that they're overrated both on ESPN. Wow, unbelievable. By the way, ESPN, the the six-month anniversary or the five-month anniversary of the head-to-head category league rankings being updated came and went, and they've done it. They've done it four days afterwards. The rankings have been updated, so kudos for them for, for getting the or prioritizing getting that out. And again, this is not a criticism of the writers. It is a criticism of the overall management team that tells them what to do. So they have updated those rankings. There are two players on ESPN at the moment that I think for fantasy are overrated. And again, these are guys that on Yahoo I get because I like them. I think there's value in them. And one of them is D'Angelo Russell. Last season, Russell, he was back to the playoffs before. He was bad and he got benched. He came into the season, he started, and he played poorly, and he got benched by Darvin Ham again. And me, foolish idiot, decided that I was going to um, say that I'm not sure that he needs to be held on to. He's been benched, he's struggling, they want to trade him away. I, I don't love any of this stuff. And then, of course, he came back into the starting lineup and he went absolutely nuclear for a, a period of time when he was running as a top 20 player. That was a huge, huge L for me. I was also able in that period, after I'd made that 
mistake and then had gone back on that mistake. Someone obviously believed my in earlier idea and I was able to trade for him at the expense of someone like really quite bad. So that was good. Russell's 29. He played 33 minutes a night last season with 23 usage. He averaged 18, 3, and 6. The point nine steals are not that good, but good free throws, okay field goals. And there is the added benefit of D'Lo is that if 40-year-old legend LeBron does get injured, well, he just does more. The usage goes up, and importantly, the assist rate goes up. But these are all the things I'm telling you that's the positive of D'Angelo Russell. Why is he ranked at 41 on ESPN? Why is his category league, category league ranked 41? Why is his points league ranked 47 on ESPN? That, 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 eliminate, that assumes LeBron plays 30 games. That is insanely high to me. So while I love getting D'Angelo Russell's 70s, sometimes you'll go to the 80s. I love that part of it. That's amazing value for the majority of, of cases. But like his fan tracks ADP, D'Lo is 82. What are we doing with this rank of 41? Doesn't make sense. Austin Reeves, also a player that I find myself getting. I find myself drafting him at, at times in round eight, maybe round nine even. His Yahoo ADP sits at 84 and his Yahoo rank is 91. Absolutely bang on. I'm good with that. I think there's value in looking at all of those numbers. I I, I don't love that Austin Reeves' ADP on ESPN is 77. Now, that's not as outrageous as the rank of D'Angelo Russell at 41, but 77, I feel like he's just taking a little bit of that value away. Reeves played 32 minutes a night in his first full year as a starter, 20 usage, and like Russell, if LeBron is out, his usage and assist rate will rise. And actually, we're talking about Reeves under the lens later on. 16, 4, and 5.5, and bad defensive numbers, good field goals, good free throws. He's a, he's a pretty good player. But I don't love him at 77 again. It just feels like we're taking the value proposition, the upside opportunities uh, away by going that high. But of course, it's on ESPN. Today's episode is brought to you by, who's it brought to you by? Fangio, Fangio Sportsbook. Of course it is because the NFL season has started and you can start the season with a big return on Fangio, America's number one sportsbook. So when you're watching a game in the middle of the game, you get an idea, you get a hunch, you get the light bulb going off, you go, oh, I think I saw something. Maybe we need to get on FanDuel and have a look. Well, you can do that. You go and check all the places where those bets are available to place, but you can check at that exact same spot the live stats and the play-by-play -play for that game, all in that one spot. So when that idea hits in the middle of the game, you can see all of the information you need right at your fingertips. And if you are a new customer on FanDuel, you can get a $200 bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. You can go on to FanDuel and check all that live NFL action. Thursday night football happening right as we're recording this. College football starting over the well, starting your games you know over the weekend and NFL week four I guess is coming up and NBA preseason is starting like next week yeah there's a lot of stuff happening over at Fanduel so go to Fanduel.com to get started and don't forget to gamble responsibly okay so we've talked overvalueds and undervalueds let's take a look at if there are any is there any player on this team who we might consider a breakout candidate. And I've got one name. It's Max Christie. He was a restricted free agent. The Lakers gave him a contract which absolutely 100% does not tie in with the production that Max Christie has shown so far. And often there can be a an idea or a hyper-focus on, well, he's definitely not done nothing to deserve that. And that's true. He Max Christie averaged four points a game and he got a four-year, $32 million contract. He's 22, it's, he's 6 or 5. He played 14 minutes a night. He averaged under one assist with 0.3 steals and shot 43%. None of that is objectively good at all. Those numbers are bad. So why would they invest four years, $32 million in it? And I am, I am for this. I do not like the idea of overpaying someone past their prime, Jimmy Butler, $60 million a year when they're 36 years of age. That's what he was worth at age 25. I'm not saying that Christie's done literally anything to suggest that paying him $8 million a year is worth it now. But my thought with contracts is that you want to pay them for what you think is going to happen while they're on that contract. So that's that's how I would look. Well, you, you have done nothing, so I will pay you a minimum contract. And that'd be great for a team. Absolutely, that'd be great for a team. But also, that would annoy agents because they say, well, you haven't given me a chance, so I haven't done anything. So $8 million for Max Christie, done nothing to prove that. But what it does show to me is that the agent would have come and said, we want this money. And the team said, yeah, okay, but the team paying that much money 
or the, the, the limits of luxury tax, aprons, to me, that suggests they want to they want to use him. Because otherwise, they would have said, go to restricted free agency. We don't care. We just don't want to pay this money. We'll work out a sign and whatever. We don't value you to be a rotation guy. But they do. So we'll see. I don't think that we need to be drafting Max Christie in 10s or 12s or 14s or 16s, really. I don't think that's going to be something that is a requirement, a necessity, or even a good decision. I love good decisions. I'm not sure that would be one. But tie all this stuff in. Why did they pay him? He's young. He's got an interesting skill set as a shot-blocking guard who can hit some threes and score a little bit. And that obviously, you know, this is probably more for one in, in two years' time if a LeBron eventually retires or whatever happens. But there is obviously an opening. The Rihachimura is not it. Christie could play the three and LeBron the four. That is possible. So we just need to be aware of the name and not just write it off to insane cap management, which is very easy to do with any decision that Rob Polinka makes. Shout out to player option legend Christian Wood and Cam Reddish. And you know if someone's picking up a minimum contract player option, you should never have given them the player option to begin with. That's how you know it was a terrible decision. Shout out again to Rob Palinka. Let's um, let's talk about the risks that could be apparent in this Lakers rotation when we're trying to figure out how we're going to um, how we're going to um, process our ideas for fantasy projections. And one thing we don't know is what the hell JJ Redick is. We know what he is. It's a white guy that went to Duke that everyone hates. We know what JJ Redick is in that respect. We have heard JJ Redick on podcasts. We have seen him on the TV. We've seen all of this stuff. Just another one that ESPN lost, who actually provided genuine basketball conversation. Different situation, of course, but yeah. At least uh, Kendrick Perkins and Stephen A. Smith are there to do something. What is JJ Riddick's scheme? We've heard, we hear platitudes of things. We're going to run the offense through AD. Yeah, okay. Good work. That's a, that's a fantastic idea. When you've got LeBron, D'Lo, and Austin Reeves to handle the ball, why wouldn't you give it to the worst passer of that quartet? Although, yeah. Maybe we do see more usage from AD. Will AD's crying find a receptive audience in terms of, please don't make me play center, sir. I, I, it's too hard for me. Could that could that be something that, that Reddick buys into as a guy with the relationships with LeBron? And I'm guessing he'll have a pretty quick relationship with Anthony Davis. They can talk about their time in with the Pelicans. Davis, last season, was awesome. 35 minutes, 33 usage, 25 and 13, three and a half assists, 1.2 steals, 2.3 blocks, 56 and 82. Now, at the start of last season, I think I had Davis about 13th or 14th. Yeah, there was some worry about the fact that he'd gotten hurt in the past, but my major concern with Davis's numbers, because as you know, that when there are small injuries that don't really have a reason to recur, I don't care about them. My thing was that Davis's Rebound numbers had fallen way off. Davis's free throw numbers were a gigantic liability as well. I was like, dude, does that stuff actually return? Well, the answer was yes. It did return in a huge way. And that is what bumped him to be as good as he was. So I have no problem with taking Anthony Davis at five this season. If you wanted to make an argument because you're so anti the playoff schedule of Luka Doncic, if you wanted to take him ahead of Luka Doncic, I probably wouldn't, but you could. And I don't think any draft should really let Anthony Davis fall outside the top six. And I don't, I'm not going to sit here and there'll be people who say, well, how can you draft Davis if you won't draft Embiid? Very different story. Again, just points to me one thing that Anthony Davis has had surgery on that's a key lower body injury that has happened multiple times. And you can't, and that is why I'm out on Embiid and why I don't care about Davis. Now, contrary to that, I tweeted this out the other day as well, is that I'd heard on multiple shows of people saying, well, now, you know, Anthony Davis, you, got, you love, love looking at him and what he can do for the Lakers this season. One, there was fantasy talk. There was non-fantasy talk on this with Davis saying, yeah, we, we can trust him. He's a really easy um, first-round guy. He's shown that he's uh, passed his injury problems. And that is just not the way you approach this because he's not. I'm not telling you that Anthony Davis is going to get injured, but one year of not getting hurt doesn't mean that you then don't get hurt ever again. Much like a season where you have weird injuries doesn't mean that it'll happen every single season. And that has always been the key point and key takeaway from this. It's not to say that someone won't get hurt or to say that someone will get hurt. It's to say that you don't know. And one year of data doesn't suggest either way. So there's going to be a risk with Davis, as there is for basically every player, that they can get hurt. But one year of staying healthy does not mean that Anthony Davis will stay healthy. 
And that is a very key point. Do not draft Davis because he is over his injury concerns and he will stay healthy. That is not a thing. Draft him because he's great. We'll see whether he, how much he actually does cry, though, about um, about playing at center, which when he if he doesn't play at center as much, that does hurt his fantasy value. Now, on the positive side of that, there's no one to play with him because Christian Wood is bad and hurt. Christian Coloco is there as a two-way. Jackson Hayes is bad. He, he has to play center, so I don't worry too much about that. Two of the other things is that Jared Vanderbilt was banged up all of last season, and he was a starter for them for most of the year before. And Gabe Vincent was brought in to play a key role as a third guard off the bench, and he didn't play. Both of those guys could be healthy. Vanderbilt, I'm not sure. And they could play 26 minutes, or they could be hurt still, or they could be healthy and play 17 minutes. We just don't know, because we didn't really see anything to do with them last season um, in the roles that you know, m- most people, I guess, um expected them to play. So that will be uh, intriguing to see how that goes about. We're going to come back and we're going to put Austin Reeves under the lens. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports as well. All you do is you go and you look at the individual player stat projections and you pick more or less on between two to six of them. And then you watch your winnings roll in. You can play against celebrities like Joe Budden, MMA star Sugar Sean O'Malley. You can look at Drewski as well. He's a person that plays prize picks. All of that is on the uh, promos tab under community plays. And you can check out what entries those guys are playing. They've also got the flex play, which means that you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks does not hit. So download the Prize Picks app and use the code Locked On NBA for getting fifty dollars instantly when you play five bucks. That is code Locked On NBA on Prize Picks. You get fifty bucks instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to get that fifty dollars bonus. It is guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. Let's talk Austin Reeves. It is uh, time to put him under the lens because again, I think there was a slight overation. Overation. It's not a real word, but we'll go with it. Uh, of him on those ESPN ADPs. And he was a player that we got the full-time starting opportunity for him last season. who put up some great numbers the year before. And I was relatively in on getting uh, Reeves around that 90-80 spot last season with some levels of skepticism. Because part of the reason that Reeves was able to put up so much success in that year before was an insane free throw rate and an insane two-point percentage. And they're the things you look at and go, well, is this a real thing? Is he going to be able to hold at those levels? And for the most part, the answer is, it's it's no. But he still was good. Look at all that green on the offensive side of the ball for Reeves. Like that's pretty high load and creation and passing skill. And his three point attempt rate should be a little bit better. And his free throw rate is still really good. But we're again talking of a guy that was had an insane free throw attempt rate, an insane rim finishing type numbers, and a really high true shooting. And it came back. But I'm glad that it did because it shows you what not a worst case is, but a realistic case is for what Reeves can bring. And defensively, yeah, he sucks. Like, he doesn't get any steals. There's no deflections. He never gets blocks. He's really quite bad defensively. That is a problem. But he's also in that spot, much like Russell, that if LeBron is out, or if Davis is out, he is going to get more usage, and he will get more assist opportunities. And he can run as a point guard. He can run as an off guard. Now, he had lots of struggles and consistency issues last season because, you know, that's realistically the sort of player that he is. But I think we got at least a, a leveling of, of where he sits as, as a guy. A couple of things to show on this one. The top graph on the right-hand side is his free throw attempt rate. And as you can see in year two, which is 22-23, it absolutely spiked out of control. Around 50% was the projection. But it is tailed off and tailed off. And then we had the NBA rule changes towards the end of the season. And it tailed off even further. And that's good. Now, 30% free throw attempt rate is still a good number. But it's not 50. And, I, and I'm glad that he didn't maintain a, a number which feels really completely unsustainable because now we get an idea of what Reeves is at more realistic numbers. The other thing that he was is an incredible two-point percentage player. So the bottom graph there is his field goal percentage from mid-range. Now you'll see there are some big fluctuations in his numbers. He started off really poorly. He was above average for most of the year. Some big spikes, some big drops, but the season went on and heading into the playoffs. He really started to get that back. So I'm starting to get a level of confidence that Reeves maybe just is a really good mid-range converter. Maybe that's just what he is. 
And if you have a look at the basketball index headshot plot, the y-axis is his mid-range shot making efficiency. And then the x-axis is initiator rate. So how often you're being the play initiator. And I've done 2023 and 2024 on that. And what is very interesting with Reeves is some of his mid-range shot making efficiency drop from 20, uh, 2023, where he was sitting up you know, close to like 97 percentile. And he fell down to like, I say 90th percentile. Still pretty good, but a decline. But what did improve is how much he was used as a point guard. So he was like 75th percentile initiator as 2023, about 87th percentile in 2024, which again is intriguing. And what you'll notice is that D'Angelo Russell in 2023 was 95th percentile initiator. In 2024, he was 90th. So him and Reeves were very far apart. And then Darvin Ham made them basically be the same in terms of how much they're running as a point guard. Now, I don't know what JJ Reddick will do, but that did flip those guys in together, which is a really intriguing um, really intriguing change. Some of the other faces on there, you've got um, Bradley Beal, who, you know, 24 to 23, he became more of an initiator last season. And that's the sort of player, I guess, that Reeves is like this uh, hybrid two who handles the ball and shoots well and has some defensive struggles. He's a similar sort of player, but you'll see Reeves is a better mid-range guy than what Beal is, and then handled the ball a similar amount to what Bradley Beal did as an initiator. And that was a change in his role from where he was the year before. Again, Austin, Austin Reeves, JJ Reddick can change a lot of this stuff, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. What I don't like is when we look at the fantasy similarities between Reeves and other players is the names that come up with a similar shape are Jaden Ivey. Jordan Clarkson, Malik Monk, and Dennis Schroeder. These are all players that are going much later than Reeves, as they should. But with guys we look at and go, I'm not all that excited about the level of upside there. And I think that's sort of how we feel about Reeves. He's going to have some iffy percentages or field goal percentage at times. The defensive stats won't be there. He won't rebound at a super, super high level. And the usage is going to be you know, dropped down because of other players on that team. The difference with him is I think he's a better passer than most of those players. Um, he's got that free throw ability or getting to the line ability, which might be ahead of a few of those guys. But the other thing is, is there is upside due to a 40-year-old man being the best player on that team, second best, depending on how you view Davis, that if he is hurt, that Reeves gets that easy, very quick opportunity to be able to do more, which I think is, um, I think it's important to note. Not that we don't know it. What about injuries? Who are the injury concerns on this team? Jared Vanderbilt Bar looked like he suffered a torn Achilles when the injury happened last season. They said it was a foot sprain and it kept him out forever. And now the report is that maybe Vanderbilt is not going to be available in training camp. He's not going to be ready, which is obviously not ideal. And it probably limits our thoughts on whether Vanderbilt could be a fantasy option or not. He played just 20 minutes a night last season. He's a low usage player. What he is is a very high steals guy as a big man. 1.2 steals in 20 minutes is an outrageous number. He it has in the past been a very high field goal guy, but that did drop off. He's a solid enough rebounder, but they have him playing sort of different roles with LeBron and Davis around. And even if we did find out that he was a starter and he was healthy, I don't think we'd be super excited about using Jared Vanderbilt Barr in fantasy leagues. But that's an injury, and it looks like it's going to um, linger into the beginning of the year. I am including LeBron James on the injury concern because as I've said for the 50th time, he is old. He is turning 40 in December. He is, I'll say he is the GOAT. I believe that he is the GOAT. But that is, if you don't, and that is totally reasonable, and I'm sure the comments will definitely ignore that comment. Um, But he's 40. He was healthy last season. That, again, does not mean that he's healthy now. He played 35 minutes at 29 usage. It could become 34 minutes. And JJ Redick might be saying... LeBron, my guy, please stop playing this much. We need you to be in better shape later on or we need you to be firing on all cylinders later on. Could be. There's just inherent risk with somebody that old. LeBron still was LeBron, like 26, 7, and 8. That's LeBron. He hit two threes at a really high rate. His free throws were 75. His field goals 54. He's still doing LeBron things. He's still fine in second round or even the first round of points they drafts. But the risk is the 40-year-old part of it. The risk is that he gets hurt and it takes a long time to come back. 
spoken about Anthony Davis as well. I am putting him on this injury concern list just because I know that many of you will say that there are injury concerns with AD. There'll be some who say the injury concerns are gone. There'll be some that say they always exist. As you know, I'm in the middle. So I'm putting that there that Anthony Davis' injury concern is being Anthony Davis. I am not worried about it. Gabe Vincent, knee problem last season, really limited him. We did not see him at all. Um, he was their key signing. I thought there was a chance if he was going to roll as the level of Gabe Vincent we'd seen in the playoffs the year before that he could take minutes away from D'Angelo Russell. Very obviously didn't happen, and now I don't think there's a chance that goes on. He averaged three points a game in 20 minutes on 11 usage, 11. He shot 30% from the field and 50 from the line. I could throw nearly all those numbers out there. They mean nothing. He needs to be better than that, but this is a huge setback, and I, and I do worry that maybe the knee is just not going to be fully good. He was just bad. Um... Speaking of just bad, Christian the Crucifix Wood, who, to be fair to Woody, he adjusted. He's been a guy who'd been a high usage player who had struggled at times with efficiency numbers, who would never pass and be a lovely points and rebounds guy who'd block some shots and never be on a team that was good. And last season, he saw a smaller role, 17 minutes with 18 usage, which is very unwood like. He had seven and five. Shot 47 and 70, which is very is very woodlike, but he sort of scaled back his nonsense. There's always been something with him and agents and family for every of the 10, 15, 30 teams he's been on. But that was okay last season. And now, though, the knee injury, he suffered a knee injury last season. He's had another knee procedure now and he's going to miss the start of the season. I, at the age of 29, I, I worry that Wood, who's had so many different issues and concerns and fit, I, I worry he's done. I know people were frothing Christian Wood as a unbelievable minimum signing. He's going to start next to AD. People were drafting him in 12 team leagues. I don't remember, but I hope I wasn't. I probably I might have been. I don't think so. Because I was also like, there's no way he's not good and he cannot start. But we're also at that stage now that yeah, he picked up a minimum player option because I think he's going to be out of the league pretty quickly after this season. Or yeah, maybe he's dealt at some point this year as well. I, I don't see any sort of rotation role for him. Another Christian though, could. And that's Christian Coloco, who was an interesting second round pick from the Raptors and then last season didn't play, which we didn't really hear information about for a long time, but it was a very serious condition, a blood clot in the lung um, concern. The NBA medical team has cleared him to play. So that's great news. He's a seven footer who's 24 years of age. The last time he played, which was as a rookie, he averaged three points and three rebounds in 14 minutes, but he blocked a shot and he started a lot of those games. I wouldn't worry too much about the 48% shooting. I think that that can easily be, if he could be 57, 58, easily. I think there was just a lot of rookie weirdness. And he blocked shots. So he's a guy that I would like to see be able to push into that that role as the backup center instead of Jackson Hayes, instead of Christian Wood. I don't know that you'd want to play him together with AD too much, but maybe. And he's someone that's at least worth... Um, keeping some tabs on to see how he looks, how the health is, and how JJ Redick uses him. Let's talk about the Lakers and their um uh, and their fantasy schedule. They've been given a some may say kissed on the deck a really good schedule in terms of the lowest amount of or thirteen back to backs, which is a very low amount. They have fifty quality games, which is in the middle, so they're on TV a bit, not as much as the Bucks in terms of playing on low volume days, but fifty is pretty good. They've got thirteen maximum game weeks, and their playoff schedule's pretty solid as well. If you finish March twenty third, they go three four three. March 30th, it's 4-3-4. Yahoo default is 3-4-4. And ESPN default is 3-4-4-4. What do we need to pay attention to now? We need to look at the young guys coming in. Well, the young guys on the team. Who sits on this roster who is under the age of 23 that we can take a look at some dynasty value? And they've got five players, actually, who are under 23. One of them is Max Christie, and I've talked about him already. I am a little surprised that my Baysmore Dynasty metric didn't love him. They've got him top 200, which is okay, but it didn't love him. And one guy that it did like a little bit more, which I was surprised to see, was last season's first-round pick, Jalen hood Shafino, who was an unmitigated disaster as a rookie. And there are a couple of things to remember with this. I didn't love hood Shafino at the time of the draft. There were some really bad shot selection issues for him coming out of Indiana. Right? That was that was a problem, but he had the size and some passing ability. That was all that was all true. It is worth remembering though, before you go in and we're going to talk Dalton Connect soon, before you go and glaze Dalton Connect, 
wouldn't Shafino was picked at about the same spot in the draft, in a better draft? And everybody has written him off as a player. And I get it, because we saw nothing. He's still just 21. He played five minutes a game last season. He averaged one point with 0.4 assists, 1.6 points, and shot 22%. Very hard to read anything into those numbers. And then we didn't get to see him at Summer League because he was recovering from back surgery. So we worry about back surgery for sure. And I should have had him on that injury list. I just didn't have enough room and he was down the bottom. And I knew we'd talk about him here. But I'm not going to fully, fully give up. It was a terrible start. And there were so many players picked after him that they could have taken that would have been way better for this team. And at the time, I think a lot of people suggested that. But I'm not going to fully give up on Hood Shafino, who still comes out projected top 200. If we think Jalen Hood Shafino didn't do anything as a rookie, then Maxwell Lewis was basically a uh, had minus stats. Like I, the numbers that Maxwell Lewis as a second round pick out of Pepperdine put up are unbelievably low. Top 275 for him from a uh, Bazemore metric. There he averaged 0.3 points on 19% shooting. I thought he actually showed pretty good pop at Summer League this season and looked to be like, yeah, I'm a second year NBA player and I'm better than a lot of these guys, which is super encouraging. It's what you want to see. So we love that part of it. Let's talk about someone that I know you've heard spoken about before. His name is LeBron James Jr. And there are varying opinions on Bronny. There are some people who think that he is trash and wouldn't be in the NBA and, and I'm not one of those people. Um, Dynasty-wise, I still only have him as a top 250 player, but defensively, he's, he's very good. Passing-wise, he's solid. Shooting, terrible. Undersized as well. But there are also people who think that the Lakers are going to like go and start Bronny and he's going to play 70 games and 20 minutes a night. And I know you can worry about the nepotism of him being drafted at a very late pick or the contract that he got commensurate with what Chris Livingston got last season. All that is true. Um, but I don't think the Lakers are going in there and sabotaging a season by starting LeBron James Jr., by having Bronny play 25 minutes a night as a part of the rotation, unless he is ready. I Maybe I am wrong. I am almost certainly not, but I know that people believe this. His college numbers are horrible. Obviously, he had a terrible situation. He had the heart attack. And we didn't know if he... A, didn't know if he was going to be alive, or B, didn't know if he'd play basketball again. So he shot 37% from the, the field. That's terrible. He played 19 minutes. He had two assists and 0.8 steals. And I just don't know what he's going to be. My bet is he doesn't turn into a long-term NBA player, but his defense is good enough to, to get roles at somewhere on the court. The last guy on this list of under-23 is Armel Traore, who is a uh, two-way contract player who had a little bit of intrigue to me, but you know, I'm not going to get super excited about him. He's a, a top 300 player in my uh, dynasty metric. The guy that came out with the biggest risk-reward, maybe I need a name for my risk-reward metric. At the moment, I'm just going to call it risk-reward. It was D'Angelo Russell. The variance for him in category leagues was about 70 spots, best case, worst case. And for fantasy points leagues, it was 5.5 fantasy points. But that's largely because of some of the things he relies upon, like free throw percentage, that can create that um, your variance. And that is a very highly um, up and down category. L lastly, who's over the hill? Now, I know your immediate reaction is going to be, man, they've got so many old assholes on this team. It's going to be, yes, everyone's going to be on this squad and everyone is old and there is two players. It's Anthony Davis and LeBron. They are the only players on this team who are over the age of 29. And we've gone into depth about LeBron and his aging. And Davis, yeah, maybe Davis does take some sort of step back or whatever, but I'm not really worrying too much about that. But they're the only two players who fit that over the age of 29 criteria that are on this team. So the guys that we haven't spoken about, I think we do have to talk about um, Rui Hachimura because I, I think that you know, the likelihood is that Rui is starting and I would not touch him in 10s. Would not touch him in 12 team leagues, even points leagues. He played 27 minutes last season with 19 usage. 13 and a half points is fine. And as soon as someone gets double digits, we think that's good scoring, but it's not. Remember, 18 is average in a, in a 12 team league. 13 is not good. Four rebounds is putrid. 0.6 deals and 0.4 blocks are bad. The 54% shooting is good. And he does go on hot streaks, but he's definitely not reliable in terms of his shooting. And basically, he needs a lot of minutes and a lot of the ball to be anywhere close to reliable. And maybe. If LeBron is hurt or Davis is hurt, then he will do that. But I just also don't think he's good. And I know Lakers fans are pretty high on Rui heading into last season, but I think a lot of them have realized that, yeah, he's not. And he is a backup and they need to do something to upgrade that position, but they probably won't this season because of them being the Lakers. 
So let's bring us let's bring us to talk about Dalton Connect now. Their first round pick, who a lot of Lakers fans will tell themselves, a lot of people in the media will tell themselves that the Lakers somehow managed to get the steal of the draft. Unbelievable! They got themselves a top five player at pick seventeen. What a what a W from the Lakers. Or there is a possibility that maybe Dalton Connect isn't a top five player in this draft, and that is how I view him. Always remember this. I did not have Connect in my. I think I had him twenty first. He is an older player, so he didn't qualify for my under-23 segment because he is not under-23. He is an older player who really did start to step up playing as a 50-year senior at Tennessee. Now, he was doing it in a really strong conference, and he put up some good scoring numbers, but he did it on 33% usage, averaging 22 points. He hit 2.63s, which 2.63s is good, and the idea is that he's his elite knockdown shooter, and he's not. He's a pretty good shooter, but it doesn't mean you translate into becoming an elite NBA shooter immediately. He didn't have the shooting profile of an elite shooter. 46 from the field and 77 from the line is not elite. 0.7 steals and 0.6 blocks are poor. I'm not sure about his passing. It's very bad. In summer league, he was sort of the same guy. Like the passing and defense was passable flash moments and other times bad. His shooting was bad in summer league on small sample size, which is okay. He's not going to be that bad. But I also don't think he's an elite knockdown guy. He, to me, is a player who excelled in college as an older guy who dominated and had the ball in his hands. And yeah, he is actually really athletic. He does, he can, he could get to the rim and throw down big dunks. I do not see this sort of player who is, if he was 6'8", I'd be like, great, I love that for you playing the three and playing the four. He's like 6'5". So he's like a shooting guard size player. Can play up at the three a little bit. I just think there's too much missing there. And maybe he is a, a, a catch-and-shoot guy playing off LeBron. And as everyone knows, LeBron makes everyone better. We'll get to Cam Reddish in a second. LeBron makes everyone better. And you'll get so many open shots. And that's great. Do we want someone hitting two threes and playing 24 minutes a night? Is that a fantasy option? Of course, it's not. But he plays for the Lakers. People had this idea that he was his gigantic steal in drafts. Like his Yahoo ADP is 148. It's 139 on ESPN, and ESPN has 140 as the ESPN as the ADP they give to everybody who doesn't have a real one. So he's actually being drafted in spots, and I don't think you should be doing that. But maybe he starts, and maybe he proves me wrong as an older rookie who's more NBA ready. Shout out to Oshai Abaji. Um, I just don't think the game is there's enough there. I just don't think he does enough, and I'm going to be very skeptical of him as a player. So a lot that we need more to talk about, I think, here for this Lakers team. I don't know whether I think they're going to make the playoffs or not. Who knows? But I do know that their team isn't really any better from a personnel perspective. Do they get healthier seasons from LeBron and AD? Or does just the upgrade to JJ Redick make all that difference? In terms of drafting these guys, I think we've talked a lot about this already. But Davis, to me, if you want to go top five, do it. LeBron probably could be in the first round discussion outside of the you are old risk. So second round, no worries. I took him in round two of a draft the other day. D'Angelo Russell is someone I love. If I'm getting him in the 70s, maybe 60s. Reeves in like the 90s, uh, late 80s. I like that area. And then after that, not touching really anybody in a 12. I might, might consider Rui in a 14. Maybe Vanderbilt in a 14 to 16, but he's not healthy. And then nobody else really steps, steps into the discussion zone for me. What is in the zone for me is you hitting the thumbs up and hitting the subscribe and giving me the boom or doom down in the comments below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.